I'm here today with Eric Lonergan and Corinne Sawyers. So Eric is a policy economist and author with over 20 years experience in financial markets. He's the co-author with Mark Blythe of the international bestseller Angrynomics, and he's written extensively on innovations in monetary policy and frequently contributes to Financial Times. Corinne Sawyers has spent the last decade advising global business and governments on climate and sustainability. She's co-founder of More United, a not-for-profit tackling tribalism in UK politics. Well, somebody needs to, frankly. And together, they are the authors of Supercharge Me, Net Zero Faster, which was recently published by Agenda Publishing. So first of all, welcome, Corinne and Eric. It's very nice to have you here. Hi, very good to be here. Hi, very good to be here. It's lovely to have two authors on the same mic in the same space. I can't tell you what a joy that is for a podcast. (laughs) (laughs) So, well, let's start off by the the sort of the impulse behind the book. And it's you, you bring your, your different perspectives. Here it is, by the way, Supercharge Me, great cover. Um, what was the thing that made you think we should bring these perspectives together and write a book about net zero faster? In Partly it was just lockdown and us spending far too much time together. <laughs> so many pandemic books. <laughs> yeah, it's far too much time together talking about the climate crisis. Um but you know, more more sort of seriously, it was it felt like this very unique moment in time where over the last two, three years, the business community and finance community have really got serious about climate action. It's really been elevated to a board level priority. Um, and sort of the writings on the wall, you know, they recognize they need to transition. So it it the mo and that's fantastically exciting and fills on with optimism because suddenly the momentum's there. But alongside that, we felt this frustration that uh, things aren't moving fast enough. The timelines are incredibly tight. We have to essentially halve emissions in the 10 years between 2020 and 2030 to hit the sort of UN ratified goals. And that policymakers weren't necessarily bringing their best goods to bear. There's a lot of sort of fantastic um, opportunities here to create wealth um, and improve living standards. Uh, And so we just felt there's a whole load of tricks being missed. And interestingly, although the pandemic created the space for you to do that, it also created massive distraction on on the global kind of business and economic and financial stage, didn't it? So in in that context. Well, one of the things is that we felt we had a very strong message you know, and I, it, this is, I think, a really important thing when you're trying to write a book is mm. the first step is to have something to say. And we had a series of meetings with Adair Turner over the last three or four years. Um, and he's been heading up the Energy Transmission uh, Transition Commission uh, in the UK. And, and in one of the meetings, we sort of said to him, look, if you were a dictator and there were three things you could do, what would they be? Because one of our frustrations is that the the sort of environmental movement has been a movement without a manifesto. Mm. So if Greta Thunberg was in power, what would she actually do? Well, we don't really know the answer to that at a practical level, other than the fact that she wants to reduce emissions. What would the actual policies be? And Adair gave us such a succinct and clear answer, which was that if we make electricity sustainable, and we get transport, manufacturing, home heating, fueled by electricity rather than fossil fuels, emissions would fall by 75%. Now, suddenly, that's a really clear message, right? We need to make electricity sustainable and run everything off electricity. And that's 75% of emissions. Now, then, you know, in both of our expertises, mine as an economist, current in sustainability, we started to think, that actually is a much clearer and addressable problem Mm. than is presented in the 30 books on climate change that we've read over the last 10 years, Um, particularly because we are blessed as a generation that the forms of electricity, wind and solar primarily, can actually be built really, really quickly. So the answer is investment spending, which we can do really, really quickly, and we have, and as we saw during the pandemic, the government can finance it. And so you're building wealth, creating assets, which you can finance at very, very low cost. 
Now, that is a totally different representation of the climate challenge or net zero than we typically read about, which is, oh, my God, we're all going to have to completely change our lives. It's going to cost a fortune. There's going to be a huge increase in taxes. Whereas this is actually saying, no, we just need an, in- an accelerated capital investment in our electricity infrastructure, and then we can collapse emissions really quickly. So we were, we suddenly, the more we started to discuss this and think about it together, we just really wanted to get this book out as quickly as possible. There's so much that's fascinating there. I'm you know, thinking particularly about how um, the, well, the global energy crisis, the fact that we, suddenly we saw that we can do impossible things very quickly when we have to. And so you're right that there's a sort of moment in time What's interesting to me as well, as a publisher and as somebody who works with authors who have to present calls to action, is, is that when you're writing about stuff like this, which is urgent, which is important, which has frustration behind it because it's not moving, it's very easy to sound shrill quite quickly and mm. and to preach the converted, to preach the choir, and, and you're not particularly reaching the people who need to hear it. And what you've just described is, is, um, is very smart in terms of communication strategy, because what you're doing is reframing it, presenting it in a really practical way. So actually, specifically, we need to do this, and this is what's involved. Was that sort of consciously part of the communication strategy as well, just in how you reach people who won't engage with it? Definitely. Yeah, absolutely. I think we, again, felt sort of frustrated. This is a partly, we have to win hearts and minds as well, you know, to make some of the policies um, politically palatable that are required. And a lot of the narrative isn't doing that. It's it's presenting, as we say, presenting it as we're all going to have to make huge sacrifices. We're going to have to pause economic growth. <laughs> Everyone's going to have to stop going on holiday, <laughs> you know. Um, and that, A, we don't believe is is true, and B is not a helpful communication strategy. <laughs> um, so, so absolutely, we were conscious there needs to be a. I mean, there's and there's lots of fantastic economists and policy thinkers doing this. We're not the first people. The Nick Stearns of the world and um, lots of American policy economists like Collinwood and Victor, and you know, they're they're bringing a very calm, fact based, and and more positive case to the table. But also I think you know, exactly what you identified, we tried to reflect in the way we've written the book as well. Yeah, so, let's talk about that, the dialogue yeah, piece, because so, it, it's, it's very striking as you read the book. Well, because our initial sort of early drafts, maybe of say the first chapter or so, both of us had a tendency to use jargon and it was it was slightly hilarious because I would be saying to Karen, you've got to stop talking like a management consultant, you know, uh, and she'd be like, you've got to stop, stop talking like an economist. Yeah, I'd say <laughs> you're, using jargon. Jargon. <laughs> you're using jargon. Exactly. The truth <laughs> is we were both guilty of, of appallingly no, heavy jargon. I speak jargon. concisely, you use jargon. Yes, yeah. that's sort of declension. That's exactly right. Yeah, yeah. So we were, and, and hopefully you got this feeling reading the book, but we made a huge effort and we were just really brutal with each other about going back over and over again and saying no jargon because we want it to be rigorous and credible, which we think it is, but we also do want it to be accessible pretty much to everyone. Um, but the dialogue achieves more than that, I think. You're, you're right that it gives it, um, that there's a sort of bracing saltiness to it. It, it is actually, it feels like two people talking, which is you know not, not what you normally get in a book. But it also allows you, I mean, I don't want to say comedy, but there, there are some moments which did make me laugh. You said, well, well, why don't we do that? Well, precisely. <laughs> and it does feel like you're kind of eavesdropping on a conversation. Um, it, it is very easy, isn't it? I mean, it's not just the jargon. It's it's the facts you have to present, the, the arguments you're marshalling. It's very easy for it to become quite abstract. And I thought that the dialogue piece, it also very nicely solves the problem that a lot of collaborating authors face of, of the first person plural, which sounds quite dead, doesn't mm-hmm. it? You know, we believe this. It sounds almost mm-hmm. like you're trying to sort of be the queen or something. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. it allows you to keep your voices. And it's worth saying, like, how we actually did it. I yes. Mean, yeah, so we it, was... St- it was also a very efficient process. The way we actually drafted did, uh, the first draft of the book was sat... Uh, dictating into our iPhone, um, you know, we'd say, okay, we'd, we'd, we decided on the structure and we'd already talked so much about it that we knew the themes and the arguments. We'd sit down and say, okay, we're doing the chapter on on the individual today and sit down for three hours and record ourselves. And we're then left with, you know, obviously a huge mess that needs the incredible editing and total rewriting. But it was a great way to force a first draft 
Um, yeah. So it is a recorded dialogue in that sense. I mean, yeah. obviously then edited and, and tightened. But we, we got into this habit that we wouldn't have any conversations about the book unless we were recording them. Uh, I can just the, imagine. Oh, if only we'd recorded that. That was great. What did you say again? Yes, that's right. <laughs> so we just thought it would be like immediately Corin would start on something. I go, we've got to record this. We've got to record it. <laughs> yeah. Which I imagine is hilarious because halfway through dinner, if you just happen to start talking about it, everybody's scrambling for the, mm -hmm. <laughs> for the yeah, recording. Yeah. Yeah. And it's really, really funny. What do you think it makes possible for the reader in terms of just engaging with the concepts? So um, a few different things. One is, one is we're intentionally, you know, we think there is an optimistic case, but we're intentionally steering away from that sort of doom-laden pessimism um, because we think this is an optimistic story in both that we can address it and a whole lot of good will come from the restructuring of our economy that is required to meet the climate crisis. Um, so, so we certainly kind of intend and hope that readers take that away. And I, I also hope it's a nice balance of um, very accessible, anyone can read it, but learning that you'll learn a bit about the environment, about how the business sector is addressing it, about monetary and fiscal policy. Um, yeah. That's maybe the, I mean, the kind of least... The least interesting enthusing bit. part <laughs> is what they learn about interest rates but I, you know i would hope that when you read it you come you, you know the answer if so if, if anybody says to you what do we need to do yes mm -hmm. every anyone who yes. reads the book knows exactly what we need to do well you and, say anyone who reads the book sorry can, yeah. can you finish well, that point one of the point is is we do talk in the book about um you know s simple maths we we did we we kind of separate the problems of of the challenge of transitioning our economy into problems of simple maths, mini musks, and herding sheep. And what we mean by that is the simple maths ones are really where we have the technology. It's about the economics and the policy. Get the numbers right, and we can make it happen. Like is happening in in solar and offshore and onshore wind and and lots of these other areas of investment. Then there's mini musks where we mean maybe we don't need many more Elon musks, but we need lots and lots of innovation and, and really great R&D. And then we talk about herding sheep, which we would put ourselves into this category, which is most human beings. And, and the way we think, we've got a very, very realistic view of, of corporate behavior, political behavior and human behavior. And if you look at all of the literature and social psychology, you know, there's only, it starts with a small minority. It's a small minority of very motivated people who tend to change our perception of norms. And most of us will only change our behavior if, if the change is, a, is an economic saving, is pretty easy to do, um, or if our friends are doing it. So we respond to what we perceive other people to be doing. So we do address this, you know, we go through the different, you know, what should companies do? What should individuals do? And for individuals, we kind of say, you know, don't worry about whether you're using a dishwasher or washing by hand. If you want to have an effect here, you have to become an activist. And actually, the power of activists today is pretty extraordinary, whether that means, you know, pestering your local MP or it just means going on Twitter and retweeting stuff from Greenpeace or calling out companies who are, you know, not giving full information about what they're doing or their products don't live up to their promises. I mean, it is amazing. And we give lots of examples of what, 20 motivated individuals can actually achieve so yeah. hopefully you know everybody should come away very well informed and, and with greater clarity if you're a policy maker you have a you have a, a manual here of the policies and if you're an individual and you really want to do something about it you know we address that as well and, and hopefully just give you convince, conviction in how much power you can have yeah and how supercharged you are one of the things that really struck me was that range of readers that you have in mind. So there is uh, the policymaker, you know, at the kind of real professional engagement end. And then there's just somebody going, I don't really understand the arguments about sustainability and how you know, is it even possible? And you've got something for everybody in there. Now, that's a great strength of a book, but it's also quite challenging because it's it's very broad. How are you actually using it now in terms of how you get people engaging with it and I mean, the book's a great starting point for understanding the arguments. What do you want people to do with it and how do you enable that? Yeah, and I... Great question. It's a great question. I'll just start by saying we did have quite a bit of feedback from, you know, the various... Our researcher who was helping us and various people who read drafts saying, 
you know, this is a risk. I don't think you you need a more focused audience. You're trying to speak to too many segments, but we kind of stuck to our guns and thought, you know, we know it's a risk, but but we want to write something that's very accessible. But we also think we have some ideas in here for the the policy experts and, and business leaders who really know this space inside out. Um, so I think we did take a bit of a risk mm. on that. In terms of how we're using it, um, we really are. You know, our goal is to influence policy. You know that that is the goal. Um, so we are targeting as much as we can influential groups, think tanks, you know, MPs in various countries, and actually writing more specific blogs where we go into more detail on some of the policy ideas um, as a way to kind of uh, build that audience's conviction and understanding of the policy ideas. Um, yeah, I think that's right. So, you know, we've got a, a, at some level, we've, we're trying to sort of have plans for each of those different different areas of the readership. We, we are trying to promote the book as widely as possible. So, you know, we are doing, you know, we were just in, in Dublin. Um, we did a kind of live podcast at one of the theaters on a Saturday night. There were a lot of... Um, um, how can I put this politely? But, but fellow Irish people who'd had a few drinks, you know, and that was not a hardcore policy audience. But you know, we wanted them to get engaged. Um, you know, so so we want everybody to get engaged. But then, cl- clearly, our messaging and the the framing we use has to be very different depending on the audience. So, so you know, that was more about storytelling and you know anecdotes that that may bring out points, but are more interesting that that, that will resonate. But then, as Karen said, we're also doing blogs. We're also di- directly engaging with policymakers, um, and, and you know, we're trying to be involved with with activists as well, um, and, and try and help that framing, um, and and just give people more confidence that this is something we can succeed in in doing, and we can have an impact. It's it's a really interesting model because you're right, the received wisdom is that a book should be written for quite a tightly defined audience. You have secondary audiences, but there's a sort of, you know, key primary audience. And and that is a great way to do it. And another thing is to write what effects is a manifesto, really. You know, it, it's got kind of thought, it's a big thought piece and build out from that different strategies for the target audiences that you have. So I think just articulating that is is quite interesting. If somebody feels that they don't want to narrow it down they do want to keep the broad focus and that's kind of an alternative way of thinking about getting the message out it's probably also just worth mentioning corin that the um the structure so the book was about 20 percent longer in terms of the main text and then what we decided to do was just take a lot of the more technical arguments and put them into end notes so if you some of the end notes are like and the kind of evidence base where we're yeah. citing numbers and yeah um, and we reworked one chapter in particular, an awful lot, which which is about interest rates. We don't want to put any readers off. But, you know, we tried to make it where it starts to get technical and you're talking about what central banks do and stuff. It's really important that people get their head around this stuff because we have organizations like central banks. And if you look at, for example, what happened during COVID, you know, what all of these central banks did pretty much saved our economies. Mm. But it's... It is a real challenge both as a, as a human being to make sense of what on earth are they doing because this is not something that most people understand or, or, or engage with day to day. And then as a writer, to convey that in a way that people can understand and engage with. But that is really important that, that you know we do try and understand this stuff because we're talking about hundreds of billions of financial resources being used, um, you know, and there's issues of democratic accountability. So we really made a huge effort and, and reworked an awful lot some of those chapters t- to kind of get that balance right where we mm-hmm. think again we don't compromise rigor and intellectual honesty but we try to make it as accessible as possible and of course end notes give you a, a, a sort of container into which you can put stuff that some people will find fascinating other people just don't want to be bothered with so again think right. about the sort of texture of the book yeah but it, really it, I, I am aware some people will find people who do know the space will find the book frustrating because of that because of us trying to 
you know, sit on two stools or what's the phrase? <laughs> <laughs> I think you normally um, fall between them. That's the problem. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. That, you know, we're trying to be very accessible and lay out the kind of the first principles of the problem and how to solve it. So if people who work in this space, like, I know all this, you know, um, but then there's other bits which will be new to them. In terms of the yeah, but ideas. I would also, you know, just in the spirit of disagreement, and dialogue. Mm-hmm. The thing I've been really happy by it is a lot of people who are experts in the field have gone, you know, I actually didn't think about it like that. I mean, mm-hmm. one area, for example, is that of carbon taxes. And, mm-hmm. and I've just been amazed how many people have come up to me and gone, I thought all economists were in favor of carbon taxes. Mm-hmm. Whereas our view is, yeah, they play a role, but they're not the main game. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, that even amongst specialists and experts, um, I, th- I think there's stuff there for for the experts to maybe pick up on too. The thing as well is that often a book like this is valuable to an, another expert because it helps them explain things to the people that they're working with. So there's a sort of secondary purpose behind it as well. So if you can articulate something better than they could, then <laughs> they may have understood that's it, true. but that's I still so. valuable. Yeah. Yeah. I have to admit the um, this concept of epics, extreme positive incentives for change, you know, we... we 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 cottoned on to the fact that this theme was very came up time and time again in the success stories in climate. Yeah. There had been extreme positive incentives, usually subsidies, that drove kind of the expansion mm. and uh, collapsing cost of solar and wind. Um, where there's pockets where EVs have really uh, kind of dominated the share of new uh, new car sales, and we were sort of trying to work out how to package it. And at first we called them RPIs, radical positive incentives, and and I remember sitting at our kitchen table and and saying, well, how about how about epics? You know, and thinking, oh no, that's too silly. No one's going to take that seriously. Now we're seeing it in print, you know, yeah. in the FT, in the Economist, and it's so surreal. Um, yeah. But it, it I, I do hope we really have focused on how do we make these ideas accessible and something someone can grab onto. And if we have achieved that, I'm really really proud. It's wonderful when you coin a phrase and then yeah. start seeing other people use it. You know yeah. that you've named something that needed a phrase and people didn't yeah. didn't have a phrase for it. That's, yeah. that's part of the, the role of an author, isn't it? That's wonderful. Mm-hmm. I'm going to ask you both for your best writing tip. Now, it's interesting. I'm not quite sure whether you're going to give me one kind of a, a, as collaborators or individually, but there's people listening who who have what they they feel is is you know they've got that same sense of opportunity and frustration. What would you t- say to them to how to get started? Well, if you want to write something impactful, I and mean, we're talking kind of business books, non you know, uh, nonfiction, as much as possible, base it in what you're doing in your day to day life and the the challenges, the practical problems, or the intellectual problems that you're seeing people butt up against. So making it as relevant as possible, um, you know. To, we really, really based everything in what we were seeing in our, our working lives um, and, and how policymakers are thinking this through. So just fo- kind of relentless focus on relevance, I suppose. Um, yeah. Yeah, the, the golden rule, I think, in, for me, is concentrate on what you have to say, which I know sort of sounds quite obvious, but... I would literally, because there's no point in writing anything unless one has something to say. So be really clear in your own mind what it is you want to say. So what is it that you disagree with or are arguing with or are trying to say? And just get that down. And just don't worry about researching it. Don't worry about uh, whether it reads well. Just make your say what you want to say, maybe on two sides of A4. And that then is the structure of your book. Yeah. And there's nothing like actually speaking to someone to help you articulate that. <laughs> you sort of did it organically, but if you haven't got somebody locked down with you that you can talk to about this stuff, then find yeah. someone. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Brilliant. Great tip. Um, I always ask people for a recommendation as well. It doesn't have to be a business book. It often is. Um, you're, are there two of you? You can, you can have two recommendations. That's absolutely fine. Um, you're not allowed to supercharge me, sorry. But what, <laughs> what book would you <laughs> recommend okay. that listeners <laughs> should read? Uh, yeah, I've actually brought mine. I did, I did stick to the business book world. Um, it's called How Remarkable Women Lead. Ooh. Um, Who's that by? And Joanna Barsh and Susie Cranston. And this was actually given to me on sort of uh, my first day of work at McKinsey <laughs> many, many years ago. Um, and the reason, 
the reason I rate it is it's to my point earlier about writing tips. It's it's based on hundreds of interviews with senior women, um, you know, across the business world. So it's incredibly concrete and grounded. Um, and it was the basis for an effort called the Centered Leadership Project, you know, focusing on accelerating female leadership. And so much of the principles behind it and what that Centered Leadership Project teaches resonate with me because they really are around, um, they focus more on the kind of the true psychology of focus on your strengths. Your strengths will be, you know, what really elevates you and delivers impact rather than your kind of development needs, so to speak. You know, focus on what nourishes you and gives you energy, both in your personal life and your professional life. Um, just a lot of things that might sound quite basic, but actually a lot of leaders, whatever gender, need reminding about what makes good leadership. Um, so, it, I, you know, I read it very early in my career and it informed a lot of how I think and I think also gave me courage to really see myself as an integrated whole in terms of my personal self and my professional self, um, which might be more the norm now, but 15 years ago, it felt a bit like you couldn't bring your whole self to work. You know, yeah. um, it is it's a real trend recently, isn't it? But it's, it's a yeah. very welcome one, I think. That's yeah. brilliant. Well, I didn't know the book, so thank you. I mean, I yeah, so it's, you know, it's why not, I asked the question. As I say, it's, it's, it's not that new, but um, I think quite timeless. Brilliant. Thank you. Eric, do you want to? I've now got my week's reading <laughs> sorted. I'm going to read. You're going to lead like a remarkable woman. So. I'm going to read. I'm going to read like a like a remarkable. Try to lead like a remarkable woman. That's a good challenge. Um, so mine, I, I, I thought long and hard about this. Um, most of my favourite business books are really boring, so I'm not going to recommend those. But my, I think my current favourite is the Citizen's Guide to Climate Success by Mark Jackard, who's a Canadian kind of policy business economist and it's just a really really brilliant book um it's it, on so many levels he knows so much he's on the ipcc so the or an advisor to them so you know the international body for climate change and um can I tell yeah you? we learned so much from it can i tell an anecdote about, well this is a book we both read and rate very highly in our research for the book and we sort of it sort of felt like Jacquard became sort of personality in our lives, you know, we, and we also, for some reason, he's Canadian, for some reason we decided he was Australian and we kind of gave him an Australian accent and we were saying, you know, what would Jacquard say? I don't know, what do you think he'd say? And we'd kind of debate what Jacquard's view on it would be and he really became a personality in our lives, I think because we fundamentally respect his experience, his approach on this, but it really got quite out of control. Uh, his Australian uh, accent, given he's not Australian at all, I don't even know where that came from. I love but that. Highly recommend the book. One of the uh, sort of exploratory writing uh, exercises that I often do with people is, you know, who who do you read, who do you listen to, you know, who who really inspired you, and and get them to coach you. I mean, they have no idea they're doing it, but you know, you're sort of writing down, you know, yeah. what would they say, and so on. And I love, oh, the I love that, that you can co-opt somebody into becoming your your mentor, even when they I have love no idea it's happening. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's really really great. Yeah, brilliant. So, so we sort of did that with Jack, I guess. <laughs> And gave him a new accent along the yeah. way. Brilliant. So if people want to find out obviously more about Supercharge Me, but also about the work that you do kind of beyond that and individually and together, where should they go? I mean, I... Got the blogs. Yeah, we, the main thing is the blogs um, where we put them up both on superchargeme.org, which is the website, the book and the blogs, uh, and Eric's longstanding blog, philosophyofmoney.net. Yeah. Right? Um, and then Twitter, it, Eric's much more active on Twitter because Eric loves loves getting into arguments. I'm much more non-confrontational. Well, I Twitter's the place to be, of, right? Mm. Yeah, I find Twitter a bit overwhelming. I don't <laughs> like everyone sort of shouting at each other. Um, but yeah, I force myself to be a bit more proactive on it to promote the book. Um, yeah. Great. Well, I should put the social links and, well, link. <laughs> I won't drag you if you don't want, Corinne. And those two <laughs> blogs up on the show notes at extraordinarybusinessbooks.com, um, along with obviously the link to to buy the book. And I wish you every success with it. It's it's a great book. I learned a huge amount and it's it just feels really timely. And oh, I like your approach. Thank you so thank much. You. Really appreciate the, the, the support and, and been a really great conversation. Yeah, it's been terrific. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you.